Good morning, everyone. Well, it is, uh, as Jordan said, just a delight to have Denise here with us. And I think all of us on staff agree that Andrew landed on his feet. Um, she's an amazing woman. And you know, one of the great skills that she brings to the table, she's a gifted writer. And so all of our communications and all of the things that we write go up a whole another level or two because Denise is here. So I am, I'm so pleased with what God is doing in our midst. As Denise said, we are studying the book of Deuteronomy, and we've called this series uh, Not by Bread Alone. Deuteronomy is really a recalling and a retelling of Israel's history to a generation that needs to remember and learn from it. And I've always felt that as a people of God today, we have a history, um, a legacy that's been handed down to us that very few Christians know about. Obviously, we know the scriptures, and we read them, and we study them, and we try to apply them. But you know, there's a whole history from the time of Jesus and the apostles on of godly men and women that have blazed a trail for us, and we today follow in their footsteps. And I thought that during this series, I would just from time to time introduce you to some men and women, um, part of our history, our legacy that we really do need to know about and need to learn from. And I want to talk to you just for a moment about one man. His name was Polycarp. Polycarp. Not a fish, a man. Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. He lived in the mid-2nd century. He died about 160 AD. And he was one of those early church leaders that formed somewhat of a connection or a bridge between the apostles and the next generation of Christians. Polycarp was a great leader in the Christian church. He lived a long Christian life and at the end was martyred for his faith. He was uh, brought as an old man to a stadium to be killed, but the officials didn't want to kill him because he was so old. The proconsul said to him, have respect to your old age and things like that. He said, swear and I'll set you free. Reproach Christ, Polycarp. But his memorable response was, and maybe you heard it before, 80 and 6 years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How can I blaspheme my king and savior now? Well, the proconsul pressed him again and said, swear by the fortune of Caesar. Polycarp answered, Since you're vainly urgent that as you say I should swear by the fortune of Caesar and pretend not to know who and what I am, hear me declare with boldness, I am a Christian. And if you wish to learn what the doctrines of Christianity are, appoint me a day and you shall hear them. After more dialogue back and forth, this proconsul said, I have wild beasts at hand, Polycarp. To these I will cast you unless you repent. But Polycarp answered, Call them then, for we're not accustomed to repent of what is good in order to adopt that which is evil. And it's well for me to be changed from what is evil to what is righteous. Well, then the proconsul said to him, I'll cause you to be consumed by fire, seeing you despise the wild beasts, if you will not repent. But Polycarp said, You threaten me with fire that burns for an hour and after a little is extinguished, but are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why are you delaying? Bring forth what you will. And when Polycarp was bound to the stake, and as the flames began to rise, he looked up to heaven and prayed a memorable prayer, thankful to God for allowing him to be a martyr for his faith in Jesus Christ. These are the types of men and women that have given to us a heritage that we build on today. We follow in Polycarp's footsteps. What the book of Deuteronomy is attempting to do is to make us all somewhat of a Polycarp. To make us people, to encourage us, to motivate us to be people who are faithful to the Lord even to the end. And maybe what Polycarp says to all of us is, no matter where you find yourself today on this journey of following Jesus, anybody and everybody can finish well if they so choose. That's Deuteronomy. You can finish well. Indeed, most of De Deuteronomy is pushing us to that point of saying, I will choose today to be faithful to Jesus, 
even to the end. Deuteronomy, as you might recall, is the fifth book in the Old Testament. We call it the Old Testament, not in the sense that it's antiquated or out of date or irrelevant. Um, I think it would have been better if it had been called the First Testament and the Second Testament rather than the Old and the New. For Jesus and the New Testament Christians, and indeed the writers of the New Testament, the Old Testament was a living resource for understanding God and His ways in the world and actually His ways with us, His people. These Old Testament scriptures, Paul said, were useful, profitable, necessary for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God would be fully equipped for every good work. And so it seems so strange, doesn't it, that so many Christians don't read or don't even want to read the Old Testament, which was for Jesus in the early church, their scripture, the place they learned about God and his ways and the way he worked with them. Well, last week, I tried to give you a bit of an overview of this book that we call Deuteronomy and shared with you that in Deuteronomy, there are four sermons, if you want to put it that way, that Moses preaches to the people. The first one starts in chapter 1, and it rolls all the way through to chapter 4 and verse 43. And I tried to summarize each of these sermons with a word. The word that catches this one, summarizes it, is the word remember, remember, where Moses recalls and recounts their history with God. And I would like today and next week to just land in this first talk that Moses gave about their history, remembering that the key word would be the word remember. Now, I want to show you on the screen, just right up front, the two main messages of this first sermon that we're not supposed to lose. Les, if you could put that up for us, that would be great. Not up. There they are. In, I can't see that, so I'm going to read it off my notes here. In Deuteronomy 1, 1 to 443, which is this first great sermon that Moses preaches, um, here's two very important messages that the people then and now are to take to heart. Mistrusting and disobeying God lead to disaster. You'll see that as you read through this part of Deuteronomy. Mistrusting and disobeying God always leads to disaster. And then the second message that's embedded in this talk that Moses gives is the opposite of that, the other side of the coin. Trusting and obeying Him leads to success. Those are the two main points that Moses is trying to drive home to this new generation that needs to know their history. Mistrusting, disobeying God will always lead to disaster. Whereas the opposite of that, trusting and obeying Him, will always lead to success. Now I'd like to read you a few verses from this part of the Bible. So I'm going to read you the introduction for a moment to this sermon. And I just I want to read you the first eight verses. It goes like this. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the desert east of the Jordan. That is in the Areva, opposite Saf, between Paran and Tophel, Laban, Hazaroth, and Dezab, or something like that. It takes 11 days to go from Horeb to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. Horeb um, is Mount Sinai, that's what it means. So you could say it takes 11 days to go from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea by the Mount Seir Road. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses proclaimed to the Israelites all that the Lord had commanded them concerning them. This was after he defeated Sion, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon and at Edre, and had defeated Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth, east of the Jordan, in the territory of Moab. Moses began to expound this law. The word expound means to clarify, to open up, to make clear, so everybody could understand the words of God. The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, You've stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Ammonites. Go to all the neighboring peoples in the Areba, in the mountains, in the western foothills, and in the Negev, and along the coast to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the Euphrates. See, I've given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. 
Now, most people picking up a book like Deuteronomy, maybe for the first time, would skip over an introduction like this as though it was rather boring and irrelevant and a lot of names and places that have long since, many of them, disappeared from the map. And yet I want to try and show you some riches that are embedded in this text. There's three things, just in this introduction, that you just, you can't miss. They're just beautiful, really, when you think about them. The first one is what he says when he says that um, these are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel in the desert east of the Jordan. What he's doing there is he's saying they're east of the Jordan, they're on the, on the banks of the Jordan, on the west of the Jordan is the promised land. So, what we read here is that these words were addressed to people on the boundary. This is a book for people on the boundary. This is a book for people on the border, on the borders. For example, you might be about to start a brand new career. You might have a new opportunity opening up before you. You might have a new job. You are on the boundary, on the border of something new. Deuteronomy's for you. You might be beginning or about to begin a marriage relationship. It's a boundary time in your life. Deuteronomy you need to take to heart. There are other boundaries that aren't so good. Maybe there's a spouse leaving. Maybe a death in the family or of a spouse has occurred. And you're on the boundary facing an unknown future, going from what's known to what's unknown. Deuteronomy is addressed to you. Um, you're about to make a choice that could destroy you. Um, a bad choice. The, you're on that boundary wondering whether you'll cross over or not. Listen to Deuteronomy carefully. Deuteronomy, the words of Deuteronomy are addressed to people who find themselves on the boundary with possibilities, promises, and problems before them. It's a pivotal book in that way. It's to people on the boundary. That's who it was written to. Those are the people that get the most out of Deuteronomy today. And then I want you to notice, secondly, Verse 2, just a, almost an aside, it takes 11 days to go from Mount Sinai or Horeb to Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea was the gateway to the promised land. It's where they landed the first time and turned back. It was the gateway to the promised land. Sinai was the place they came to first after they crossed the sea. Uh, and then it says, in the 40th year, in the first day of the 11th month. What you're supposed to get here is the contrast between 11 days and 40 years. It really only would take 11 days to go from Mount Sinai to the Promised Land, but it took them 40 years. That's the point the writer's making here. It, if Israel had trusted God, its long years of wandering would never have occurred. They would have taken what God had given them right away. Here's the point. Disobedience always slows us down and wastes precious time. Much time is wasted when we're disobedient. And it always will slow us down. That's the point the writer's making right from the get-go in this section of Scripture. And then verse 8, it's about the land. See, I've given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants after them. Three things about the land here. It was promised it was given, but it was to be taken. It was promised. The Lord swore or promised he would give it to your fathers. In other words, this boundary that they're about to cross, this land they're about to receive, is the culmination of a, of a long promise that goes way back, that God made to Abraham. Way back in Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, verse 7, God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you some promises. And one of those promises promises his land, and for hundreds of years, they waited for the fulfillment of this promise. And then, given, that's what it says there too, I have given you this land. It was a gift from God. They didn't deserve it. They didn't earn it. It was gifted to them. But then he also says to them, go in and take possession. Though it was promised, though it was given, they still had to go in and take the land for themselves. That's exactly, by the way, the way the promises of God work for you and for me today. 
The promises of God go way back. You remember what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1? that God has given us many great and precious promises that we can build our life on. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, no matter how many promises God has made, for you in Christ, they're yes, not no, but yes. In other words, you can have them. They're a gift. You didn't deserve any of these great promises. I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Uh, um, don't be afraid, for I'm with you. Don't be dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I'll hold you up with my right hand. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And how many other promises are there? If God who did not spare his own son, how will he not freely give us everything after giving us his son? No matter how many promises God has made, for, for us they're yes. They're a gift. I don't deserve one of them. I, I don't deserve to be at the table in the family let alone have these promises that are great and precious. They're a gift, but they have to be taken. They do no good sitting in the Bible if you don't take them. How do you take them? You claim them by prayer, first of all. You say, Father, you said to Job in Job 42 that you would bless the latter part of his life more than the first. Father, I want that. Father, you said you would pour your spirit out on our offspring. Father, would you begin to do that? You, you, you begin to pray it. Say, Father, I want that one. And then you begin to, to, to listen for his instruction around it. He may tell you some things that you need to do or white ways that you need to walk or live in order to experience the promise. And you, you trust him that if you take it at his word, he'll come through. I mean, the promises are, are there. They're given but they have to be taken. So you see, just even in a couple of paragraphs at the beginning of the book, these aren't throwaway lines. There's so much rich stuff. There's more in those first few verses, but I just, if I give you that, um, you, can, you can figure out some of the rest of it. But I would like to take you to the rest, uh, just a little bit of this um, first part of Moses' talk that's so incredible. And I'm going to begin reading uh, again, just down at first... Um, where do I want to begin to read? Down at verse 19. And the story picks up. In Moses' review of their history, the story picks up where a previous generation, their parents, their relatives, had arrived at Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, the gateway to the promised land, but then turned back in fear and unbelief. So Moses is going to review that history with them. Listen to what he says. Then as the Lord our God commanded us, we set out from Horeb and went toward the hill country of the Amorites through all that vast and dreadful desert that you've seen, and so we reached Kadesh. Then I said to you, you've reached the hill country of the Ammonites, Amorites, rather, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord, the God of your fathers, told you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Then all of you came to me and said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we're to take and the towns we'll come to. The idea seemed good to me, so I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. They left and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eshcol and explored it. Taking with them some of the fruit of the land, they brought it down to us and reported, it's a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, The Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites and destroy us. Just, you know, every time you grumble and you complain and you say words that you wish you could take back, you get into trouble. Did you know that? I was reading this week about a couple that were married 50 years. And someone asked the man what the secret of their marriage was. And he says, well, each day I decided on one thing I wouldn't say. That's how we, how we made it 50 years. That's not bad counsel. <laughs> Just came to me when I was reading these words, sorry. Um, well, let's try verse 28. Where, where can we go? Our brothers have made us lose heart. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Then I said to you, don't be terrified and don't be afraid of them. The Lord your God, who's going before you, will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the desert. 
There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son all the way you went until you reached this place. In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and in a cloud by day to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. When the Lord heard what you said, he was angry and solemnly swore, not a man means person of this evil generation shall see the good land I swore to give your forefathers, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh. He will see it, and I'll give him and his descendants the land he set his feet on, because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Well, in this bit of Moses' talk, in this historical review, in this incident, He's going to drive home, again, three points. Here's what they are. He's going to drive home this point, really, by recalling their history. Remember. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. Somebody said memory is what gives human beings their historical identity. Moses' talk, his sermon, recounting and retelling their history, makes a very important point about their identity. Israel's relationship with the God who freed them from slavery and then gifted them with his word is their identity. That is their identity. And after years of dishonoring that identity, it's time to remember who they are, to honor the God whose they are, and to begin to obey him. When we forget who we are, we will always dishonor and disobey God. Our identity as a, is as a people freed from slavery through the blood of Jesus Christ, given a brand new identity in Christ, given his Holy Spirit, and given his word, and that is the most important thing about you as a Christ follower. Your identity is rooted in Jesus, who freed us from slavery to sin and brought us into his family. The most important thing about you is you are a child of God, a man or woman of the living God. And so when we come to baptism... We proclaim to ourselves and anybody else that wants to watch that we have a brand new identity. The old person died. The new person has been raised to life in Christ. We have a new identity. And every time we, like last week, take the bread and the cup, communion, and we eat it and we drink it together, we remind ourselves whose we are and who we are. We are people purchased with the precious blood of Christ. And our responsibility is to obey him and honor him. And when we pray, Jesus calls us to pray, not saying God, but saying Father. Why? Our Father who art in heaven. Why not God who is in heaven? Because when we say Father, we're reminded of our identity. If he's Father, we must be children. And as children of the King, we ought to be who we are. So, these people had forgotten who they were, and part of what Moses is doing here is driving this point home. You need to remember who it was that freed you from slavery to the Egyptians, that opened the sea and brought you through, that then gifted you with his law, with his word. You belong to him, is what Moses is saying. And then secondly, he's saying, remember who God is. Remember who God is. When we forget the greatness of our God and who he really is, fear and unbelief, absolutely take over. It's highlighted vividly, of course, in the story we just read. When they came to the borders of the promised land and Moses sent out 12 spies, they came back and they, um, they gave a very good report. In fact, what their words were, the land that God gives is good. It's very good. That's verse 25. <clears throat> it's a good land that the Lord our God is giving to us. But then you have a picture of a people at their worst. It's a story of stark rebellion, needless fear, widespread panic, and blatant unbelief. We will not go in. In spite of the fact that God had given the land, plus words of assurance, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, plus a report of the goodness of the land, instead of trust, they let fear and unbelief and disobedience take over. That's what happens when you forget God. 
You get your eyes on the problems and on the challenges that look so much greater than God. You can't see God sometimes because your eyes are so fixed on the challenges, the problems that are there. In verse 28, the people say the Anakites are there. Not sure anybody really knows who they were, but in the text, what they represent is the problem that's too great and strikes fear into our hearts. That's what they represent. But then he reminds the people of God. They had their eyes on the problem. They couldn't see God. So what Moses does is he reminds them that God took a moment to ask them to lift their eyes again to who he really was. He gives them three pictures of God here. He tells them that God is a warrior. Verse 30, the Lord your God is going before you will fight for you as he did in Egypt. Then he's going to say, and besides that, God is like a father to you. You saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son. Um, I remember one time when Ryan was very, very young, and uh, we were at a place visiting. And we were leaving, and he'd fallen asleep. And so I, I, I picked him up, and I was carrying him out to the car. And as is the custom in Vancouver, it rains every day. And, and, I, and I knew that when the rain would hit him outside, as I carried him to the car, that it would startle him, and he would be disoriented and wake up and not know where he was. And sure enough, all of that happened. And I, I looked at him and I said, Ryan, do you know where you are? And he looked at me and said, yes, I'm with you. And he went back to sleep. That's the picture here. They didn't always know where they were and what they were going to do or what way they were going to turn, but they were with him, and he carried them all those years. A warrior, a father, and a guide. He went ahead of you in your journey, in fire by night, in a cloud by day, to search out places for you to camp and to show you the way you should go. God is a warrior. They, they needed to trust in his power to save them. It didn't mean they never had to fight, but it meant that when they fought, there was another power available that would enable them to have victory. He was a father. They were to remember their past and how he had always been faithful as a father from their first day to this very day. There wasn't one day when he'd ever let them down. Their hearts were fearful now, but they should remember that God wasn't about to start now letting them down. And then he was a guide. He knew the way ahead. They didn't know the way ahead. But for 40 years, he'd gone ahead of them to search out places where they should go and stop and stay and so on and camp. And Do you think he would stop now? This, this should have resulted in joy and trust, but what was the result? Verse 32, disaster. In spite of this, you didn't trust in the name of the Lord your God. Everything depends on what you see when you're on the boundary. When you're about to enter a land, when, you're, when you say to yourself, I've never been this way before, everything depends on what you see. Do you see God? The warrior who fights for you. The father who carries you. And check out Isaiah 46. You know what it says there? From the time you were conceived, I've carried you, I've sustained you, I've rescued you. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am the God that will sustain you, rescue you, carry you. And when you're on the boundary, remember he's a guide that doesn't stop going ahead of his people so that they know the way to take. In fact, Moses gives the answer here to four questions that people often ask when they're on the boundary. You know what those questions are? How will we know what to do? Well, look at verse 30. If you want to know how you know what, what you're to do, well, God's going to go before you and he's going to fight for you. In verse 33, he, he's going to go and he's going to search out places for you on your journey. You're going to know what to do because you're going to, just, you're going to follow him. Uh, do we have the ability to overcome such a huge challenge? Well, um, remember, God did that for you already once in the past. Pharaoh was a pretty huge challenge, and yet he, he, he obliterated them. And if you read Isaiah 43, it talks about Pharaoh and his armies. They, they lay in the heart of the Red Sea, extinguished, never to rise again. How, how do we know he will fight for us? Well, again, because he's already done that. 
What assurance do I have that God will really look after me? Verse 31 says, he can't stop looking after you because he's faithful and he doesn't change. And if he looked after you once, and guided you, he'll keep doing it today. So Moses is trying to drive this great point home. Remember who you are, but remember who God is. And then I suppose lastly, what he would say is remember what happens when we don't trust God. Remember, people, what happens when you don't trust God. Remember the disaster. For the next 38 or so years, you wandered in a vast and dreadful desert and wasted all that time and witnessed and went to one funeral after another until a whole generation died off. Disaster, tragedy. And Moses said, it affected not only you, but it affected me, your leader. I don't get to go in either, he says, because of you. Um, disaster. That, that, that's a principle in the Bible. It actually doesn't change. Um, it just, it, it's God. It's, it, it's his word. It's like you disobey him. You dishonor him. You, you, you turn away in fear and unbelief, and it always leads to disaster. If you want to get a picture of what those years were like, turn to Psalm 90. And I just want to take an aside here and say it, it would be really helpful in this series if you have a Bible. Um, that's why Denise said take one. Um, I, I really need to teach you. The, it's hard to teach you the Bible and we just throw a couple of verses up on the screen. It's hard if you just have the Bible on your phone because you don't get the, the overlay of it the way you do um, with, with a real Bible. So um, go down a parable if you want and buy one or, or take one from the pew, but have a Bible. But Psalm 90 is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. As far as I know, the only psalm prayer written by Moses. And, I, and, and you, can, you can see, you can get into his head here in those 38 years of disaster. Um, Lord, you've been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting. You're God, but you turn people back to dust saying, return to dust, O sons of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that's just gone by or a watch in the night. You sweep people away in the sleep of death. They're like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it's dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You set our iniquities, even our secret sins, in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath and we finished our years with a moan. That's what it was like for 38 years in the desert. And yet, and yet, it's not the end of the story. Moses ends by turning it into a positive prayer where he says, make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted us, for as many years as we've seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servant and now he's thinking about the next generation that's going to enter the land. Would you show them your splendor? And may the favor, the blessing of the Lord our God rest on them. Maybe it wasn't on us. May it rest on Establish the work of their hands. Establish the work of their hands. And he prays for them, though he himself cannot lead them across the boundary. So remember what happens when we don't trust God. Disaster, ruin. Deuteronomy opens by recounting what happens to a people who persist in disobedience and fearfulness and unbelief take over. The point of his talk is that after years of unfaithfulness, it's now time to remember. It's now time to honor. It's now time to obey. Maybe you can identify with these people. Maybe you started out well. But for whatever reason, there has been a lot of water under the bridge. Unfaithfulness, dishonoring to God. Fear's taken over. You see the challenge, you don't see God. Unbelief, and it's caused you to waste much time. So you may identify, but it's not the end. And that's the whole point of Deuteronomy. It's like God says, even now, return to me with all of your heart and I will be faithful to rebuild the ruins of your life. In fact, the ruins can become again glorious ruins. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come out. We're going to worship God, and as we do, I, I want to invite you to come up here if you would like to come up. If you're somebody who has 
well identified with these people that haven't done so well. It's God's invitation to you that you can begin again today. This is a place of renewal. This is a place of rebuilding of ruins. This is a place of forgiveness. This is a place of freedom and liberty. And I know the Lord is here today. And I know that the reason he tells us things like he does in Deuteronomy is for people like us to take the words to heart, to begin a game with a God who is utterly faithful, who still says, I will be your warrior. I will be your father. I will be your guide even to the end. Let's stand together. If you'd like to come up when we worship, just come on up and kneel or stand in the Lord's presence and tell him what's on your heart. Tell him that you'd like to come back. Tell him that you'd like him to rebuild the ruins of your life. This is a God that does miracles. This is a God that's greater than any challenge you'll ever face. This is a God you can trust. So, Father, today I pray that your blessing would be upon your people. I pray, Father, that you would call us back to that place of our first love for Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.